All right. What's up, Trust Engine and Mortgage Coach community? Dave Savage, co-founder of Mortgage Coach here, Chief Innovation Officer with Trust Engine. We've got a very special guest, uh, someone I've wanted to interview for a long time, so I'm pumped about that. Uh, Kristen Messerly is going to join me in this interview. Uh, good to have you here, Kristen. Yeah, thanks for having me. So excited to talk to you, Casey. Yeah, yeah. It's great. This is great. That, for those of you guys that, that don't know, you know, you may be a listener on this right now. This is how I got into the mortgage industry, Dave Savage. As you know, I've told you the story. You got me into this industry listening to a recording of a mortgage coach conversation between you and Bill Dallas in 2008. When uh, you asked Bill what what was next, you know, what was next, and Bill said famously, "The greatest opportunity in the history of mortgage banking is what Bill ahead, right on the other side of this crisis." And I feel like yeah. it's like you know, back to the future all over again, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> greatest <laughs> opportunity. So maybe there's some you know young 28 year old like I was listening to the uh, listening to this podcast and just let them know the greatest opportunity in the history of mortgage banking. <laughs> <laughs> maybe right on the other side of this crisis that's deeper and harder than that one. So, uh, yeah, man, it's awesome. I, it's really yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more. Although I don't know that hopefully rates don't go to two and 3% again, because that would not be good. Hey, for speak America. for yourself. Speak for yourself. <laughs> okay. So you'll take, <laughs> take the two, but it's pretty unlikely. Yeah, um, pretty unlikely. Pretty so, unlikely. so first of all, I think you're pretty well known in this space. So I don't know that you need an introduction. I do want to say, um, you know, I have followed your story at Movement and it's truly been a movement. It's amazing how fast you've grown. Uh, in 2008, when you heard that interview with Bill and I, uh, you know, what do you think the size of Movement was back in those days? If oh, you could I, well, I, I know definitively what the size was. We, we, we had, uh, yeah, we, we had filed our incorporation paperwork July 27, 2007, took a, about a year to get, you know, a warehouse line in place, get a DE and, you know, do our test cases and all those things. And and then October of 2008, you know, we were so proud. We like planted our flag and opened the doors. And um, yeah, I think that was the same month Warren Buffett came out and said that our country was on the brink. <laughs> and we had actually, we'd hired one of the number one FHA originators. We had four employees and uh, I hired one of the number one FHA originators in the state of Virginia because he had been let go from um, National City Bank that, you know, collapsed. Like, like it's kind of same kind of stories of things going on today. And yeah. Um, I remember he closed three loans that month and he always closed 30 loans a month, 30 loans a month, every month and closed three loans that month. And I, I literally remember checking to see if the phones were working. And that was, that was 2008. And I it was pretty sure I made the worst financial decision of my life and bankrupted my wife and I, and you know, that was just going to be um, a, another story of a uh, ex football player blowing what little money they had made the NFL in, uh, in some kind of harebrained endeavor. And then our federal government started buying mortgage backed securities and yeah. So the quantity. Here we are. Off we went. So, yeah, awesome. So I'm gonna, you know, kick off the first question, and Chris and I are gonna go back and forth with questioning you on, you know, just things we think both executives that are watching this want to know, uh, as well as there's, you know, branch managers, loan officers will be be watching this. So first of all, how do you describe this market we're in right now, Casey? Like, how how do you guys think about it? How do you describe it? What do you think are some of the the key well, assuming it's like factors. a pg rated show dave that we yeah <laughs> <laughs> dave it's awful i mean it's awful like it's awful i'll shout up the rooftops it is awful lest there be any uh you know miscommunication or confusion in anyone's mind it, it's awful I've, I've only you know i've been in this 16 years now and um yeah i mean by far the worst i've seen and, and you know when you look back statistically historically and kind of look at the data uh i there's never been a point in time in our industry where we created so much capacity and then had such a drop in demand, right? So, I mean, real simple economic terms, I mean, we created more supply uh, than we've ever created and then had less demand. It had more of a demand drop than, than we've ever experienced. And that's leading to more pain, I think, than we've than we've seen. Uh, and, uh, and it's tough. It's really tough out there for originators and for companies. And so I, I think it's really important, you know, to acknowledge um, how difficult it is because people know that this too shall pass. You know, th th this is our industry. This is what you're signing up for. You're signing up for incredible highs and really tough troughs. And I think that the markers of success of the folks that have success and through this industry are the ones that have the emotional fortitude and the, the business willingness to prepare and navigate those difficult times. And then, man, they take advantage of, of, of the backside of those in really, really meaningful ways. But it is uh, it is not a business for the faint of heart. That is for sure. You know, I, I got friends that run you know, big stable companies now and they, they get real excited about 8% growth or whatever it is that they're, they're looking at that year. And, uh, 
you know, they get really upset if growth drops down to 3% or something. You go, my goodness, man. You get, how would you like a 70% contraction in your total market? You know, how, deal, deal with that one. And, and so I think, and I, and I say that to, 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 to a lot of our loan officers and to other owners and things as well, because I think we need to know, um, you know, what we're going through actually is difficult. It really, it really is. You, know, you shouldn't feel like if you're in the middle of a workout, you feel like it's just kicking your butt. Um, if it's no big deal, that's kind of depressing. If you're doing a workout that like no other human on earth could do, you feel a little bit better about it, right? It's kind of contextualized. Like you can understand why it feels difficult. And so, you know, sales folks out there that are, that are feeling like deals are just, just almost impossibly hard, you know, they're right. And, and the good news is for those of you guys listening right now, man, if you're still in the game, you're winning, right? You're still in the game, you're winning. Because we've seen half of the originators in America have already exited, right? They've already left. So if you're still in the game right now, you're winning. You're picking up market share you don't even realize, and you're setting yourself up for success on the other side of this thing. But make mo no mistake, it's it's tough, and it's not over. So so just I want to get clear on something, and then Kristen, you take the next question. But you know, when I interviewed Brian Hale, and I've interviewed Brian a couple times this year, I, I just right. recently interviewed Bill Dallas, and and I am consistently hearing that you know when we hit the bottom. You know, Brian's exact words were the next five to 10 years are going to be stupendously great. And I know you 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 believe that, but but I would love for you just to put a little color around that. And then, Kristen, you ask the next question. Yeah, I, I think it's so important to you know point folks to the light. And, and, and there is there is light. There is light. If you fundamentally believe in our nation, if you believe in you know individual property rights, if you believe our federal government is going to continue to uh, you know subsidize that through credit subsidy and, and continue to, to encourage individual home ownership, like the future is really bright. It is really bright. And the more pent up demand we have, the brighter that future will be on the other on the other end of it and other side of it. And uh, that that's how our industry goes, right? I mean that, that that's kind of what you sign up for when you sign up for this industry. And so, yeah, I, I still think this is the, one of the greatest kept secrets in our nation. My, my oldest daughter is 17 years old and uh, Katie's a senior in high school. And she she came and she's looking at college and she's like, Daddy, what do you think the right major is to be a loan officer? I said, is it marketing or finance? You know, and she's asking these great questions because I've been telling her, I said, baby girl, like there are a lot of great things you can do in your life. One of the ones I think that you would just enjoy so much. And one of the ones where you can make such an impact, earn such incredible income, impact so many lives, have such great flexibility is being a mortgage originator in the U.S. And so I think, you know, I encourage folks that, man, you're in a great industry and in a fantastic industry. And yeah, as you navigate what is a difficult time right now, the macro demographics are in your favor to have fabulous success in the years to come. Just a quick note though, don't put a date on it. Don't put a date on it. I, I, I think one of the, the things I've seen that's caused a lot of heartache um, is folks coming up with these dates. And then I got some good friends. You got some good friends that have, that, have, that have come out with some dates. You know, they come out with some dates last year. Hey, I heard one May 11th, May 11th, like May 11th, rates are coming down. You know, you start the party, get the band cranking. We're going to you know, refinance the world and it's going to be great. And, uh, you know, May 11th comes and then May 11th goes. And it's still hard. And then rates go up. And I was remember that um, remember Louis Zamperini, that Unbroken book, Unbroken. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, story, right. And yeah. He, he's an Olympic, you know, sprinter, and then he, he goes and, and during World War II, he's he's in a in a boat, and then he gets his boat gets shot up, jumps the water, shark starts swimming around the water, gets back in the boat, he gets picked up by, by Japanese, gets thrown in an internment camp, and what, what he said was the guys that lost hope were the ones that said, you know, I'm going to be home by Easter, right? Easter would come, Easter would go. I said, well, man, surely by the 4th of July, the war will be over and we'll be home. 4th of July would come and 4th of July would go. So, well, by Christmas. And by Christmas, they had just totally lost hope. And he said, those that made it were the ones that woke up every day, had a routine, and thought about what they could control that day and kept a positive attitude. And so I, what I'm encouraging, you know, movement loan officers to do, I encourage all loan officers to do, you know, what can you control? Wake up every day with a positive attitude, control what you can control, do the activities that, that, that you know you need to do to become successful, and don't focus on when that's going to pay off. Just sow those seeds, not focusing on what day you're going to harvest them, but maybe just be faithful to sow those seeds, get through this time period, and you'll enjoy great success on the other end. So good. Um, this is a good segue, I think, into the next question, which is, I, I want to ask you what most concerns you about the market that we're in, but I also want to ask what you're most excited about. So whichever direction you want to start with in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm going to go like down a little bit of a niche because I think, I think a lot of our guys have a lot of macro, you know, perspective on, Hey, high rates and it's tough for people to sell. Like, I think we all, we all know that. 
Um, one thing I'm concerned about, one thing I'm passionate about us changing as an industry is the con continued disparity in white and black home ownership. Um, it, it, it is a continued and it is a persistent and it is a growing problem in our nation. It is not one that is resolving it or itself, despite really important laws that have been written, despite really important work by civil rights activists that have been done um, over the years. We And I think it's actually turning into a crisis, and it, it is um, contributing to the wealth gap that we're experiencing in communities across America. And the cool thing is, the good news, what excites me about that problem, Kristen, right, is that we sit at the epicenter of the solution to that problem. And we have such an opportunity as an industry to make home ownership cool again, right, to, to re-inspire the American dream of owning a home, of just how fundamental and transformational that could be for families, for stability, and for wealth creation in the U.S., you know, one thing I did when I started our company was I had a home equity line of credit. You know, I had, I had a HELOC on my home. That helped create some capital for me to start movement mortgage. So many small businesses are started with home equity lines of credit. And that home equity is not created, right, unless someone actually experiences home ownership. And right now, we do a lot of work around the nation. We have a, a program called uh, Be the Key. And um, what we say is, like, we want the Black community to understand they are the key to building wealth and breaking so many of the cycles uh, of, of hurtful disparity in home ownership in our nation. And we want them to take hold of that opportunity to own a home, build generational wealth, and know that there are lenders that want to work with them in that pursuit. And that, yes, the historical stories of, of redlining, of discrimination, those are true. And the, 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 those have been passed down generationally. But today, man, there are, this industry is full of great folks who want to see the dream of home ownership become a reality for all Americans and are excited, you know, by what that will do for our nation as we close the wealth gap and help everyone take hold of the American dream. I so deeply share your your passion in that space, and I um, I wonder, you know, one of the things that speaking of hope and kind of I I start to feel despairing, I think, around the affordability challenges yeah. and. Um, and some of the, I think, the increasing hurdles that exist, especially in those communities. Um, can you speak a little bit more to, I know you guys are doing a lot of holistic work around um, bringing that kind of message into your community. Can you speak a little bit more to that and how, how you're, you know, um, how you're, how you are making homeownership more accessible in that way? Yeah, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a huge problem. And it's one that I think no one has a sing, single silver bullet for, right? But 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 part of it is just, first of all, the desire. Like we have to we have to create the desire to own a home. We have to, to, to help folks recognize the incredible transformational power that home ownership represents. And, and then we have to start to instill a belief that it too can be accessible for them, right? And so much, uh, particularly of the black community, doesn't trust lenders. And rightfully so. There's a lot of, we have, we have a lot of history that we need to own in that. And, and, we need to reach out and go, but there's good news. There's good news. There are men and women all across this industry that are that are really looking forward to partnering with you in making homeownership a reality. And Kristen, I know some of the important work you do with educating young people to start actually planting a seed that home ownership needs to be a goal in their life. And, and, and I think that's incredibly important. You know, at, at Movement, we've really thought about how can we impact lives of the communities that we touch. And one of the things you know that we're doing is, is building uh, charter schools for kids born to poverty. Every one of our kids, we want to graduate high school with not just a hope, but an expectation that they will be a homeowner. And there are banks out there that will partner with them in that endeavor. Uh, about 95% of our kids are uh, from the Black community. And that's a really big deal for these kids to grow up expecting to be homeowners at some point in their life. If you had asked me when I was a little kid, you know, are you going to own a home? I said, yeah, of course, of course. I, I had no idea if it was going to be a big house, a little house, a house on a mountain, a house by the beach. But I always expected that I would own a house. And Montel Watson, who uh, runs um, our, our Be the Key initiative here, would say that he grew up with a complete opposite expectation. And Montel was told that you can't trust banks and you should never own a home because it just represents one more thing that, that will be taken from you. And it, it took him till his late 30s when he was actually a lender himself doing a number of loans for other folks that he realized, no, no, no I too can like take hold of this dream. And now he's built a um, you know, significant amount of wealth and the equity in his house in doing so. And he's trying to get that word out to the rest of the community of the incredible opportunity that exists. So it is, affordability is a huge challenge, Kristen, right? Some of it though is understanding like when you when you grow up with an expectation that you're going to be a homeowner, you start, you start acting um, and, and doing the things necessary to create a down payment, to create credit, to uh, set yourself up to be a responsible homeowner in years. And this isn't an overnight, this isn't an overnight accomplishment. And I think, you know, we, we, we do have a little bit of a, um, 
you know, microwave culture, right? We want to just pop things in the microwave, hit 30 seconds, pop them out and be done. Um, I remember, you know, gosh, man, my parents saving for, for years and years and years. And I mean, my dad working six days a week and, you know, mom working all the time just to save enough money for the down payment to, to move up to a little bit bigger home. We had about a 1200 square foot house, you know, when I kind of grew up and we moved in fourth grade, it was a massive undertaking for my mom and dad to save for years to make that happen. And um, that's part of this, right? Home ownership isn't an overnight journey, but it's worth it. It's worth it. So I think we need to inspire that that vision early, walk with people, equip them, and then make sure, man, we're giving them expert advice in this process. And I think our nation is going to be stronger when we do that well together. Love, love that. Christian, I, I have a question that kind of aligns with this, but do you want to pull anything out of that okay. before? Okay. okay. So so here's here's a question I think really synergizes with this. And, and you know, some of the new messaging Kristen's been working on with First Home IQ is, you know, Gen Zs are born into a financial literacy crisis and they're born into an affordability crisis um, and they're not getting education from their parents and teachers, at least at scale. I mean, clearly, you know, what you're doing in your high schools is, is, is changing that narrative. Um, but I would love to know, what do you think the ages are? Because you know, first of all, Gen Z is like, what is it, 14 to 25, Kristen? Is that the right age? I think that's, it I, we focus on 16 to 25, so I lose count of who's before yeah, that. Okay, but so, so let's say it's high school to college. And one of the things Kristen's trying to prioritize right now is like, hey, by the time they can really start really getting serious about buying a home, like that's probably 18 or more, but where the belief system is really being created Yes. So walk me through in your mind, and maybe you guys, you guys even have some things on how you're helping kids develop that belief that, you know what, I want to own my future. And so could you just call out some key ages and key milestones or any training that you're doing, or not training, teaching yeah. that you're doing yeah. around that? Yeah, training, teaching, all, all of those things, modeling, right? Like we, we actually, so we actually build elementary schools the, 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 and, and, our, and our schools start pre-K. So the, this is this is some grandma's wisdom here, right? Like an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The younger you start, the earlier we can sow some of these values into our kiddos, the longer um, we have those to kind of mature and, and the more impact we can make in that kid's life. And so our kids really early on, um, as early as kindergarten, start getting um, movement scholar dollars, right? And they start being able to invest those dollars. And they understand fundamentally that when you spend you know, less than you earn, you create a surplus, get Congress to go back through some of these kindergarten classes we teach. You know, when you spend less than you earn, you, you create a surplus. And that surplus is really important. That surplus gives you choices, right? They can they can buy, uh, you know, different treats at the store. They can they can invest some of those dollars and watch them accumulate over time. Uh, but I actually think this, this training is really fundamental because our spending habits are formed far earlier than many of us perceive. Our, our, our relationship with money is formed far earlier than, than we typically perceive. And I'm actually really encouraged that we're starting to see in public schools a graduation requirement that kids have a personal finance class before they graduate high school. That's in North Carolina now. It's spreading across the country. It's really important. I'm excited to watch that pushed earlier and earlier. That's one of the things we want to do with as movement mortgage, movement bank, and movement schools is start to pioneer some of these lessons that can be replicated across every school in America so that, I mean, we are graduating generations of kiddos that come out um, with just an expectation that financial stewardship and financial is, is just part of being a good citizen. It's part of serving you know, yourself well, your family well, and your communities well when you steward your own finances well. And so that's living below your means, creating a margin. And then with that margin, you know, what's the first thing you should be investing with that? Well, we'd say one of the best investments you can make is a home, right? Owning your own home um, is fabulously important, Dave. So I, I, I think there's a, there's a um, kind of an American cultural DNA um, that, that that we need to be start recelebrating again about man the value of owning a home and just when you look at the statistical correlations to you know families staying together like neighborhoods with crime rates with with um, uh, just success rates of, of you know entire communities the higher the rates of home ownership almost every other good statistic kind of tracks along with those things but um, somehow we just haven't celebrated individual home ownership in this country I think the way we did years ago where we knew it was an incredible privilege and we were thankful. You know, that our federal government was so willing to so robustly partner with citizens in that pursuit. Yeah. So so here's kind of the follow up question within that. Uh, so my my day job, my for profit job as founder, a mortgage coach and um, with uh, Trust Engine 
has always been to change how people get into debt in America. I mean, I have had a very unique view into how loan officers can either quote rates and do pre-approvals or how they can help people understand how to build wealth with real estate and achieve financial freedom. And then first to my IQ, it's it's really about, hey, let's get to these kids younger. Now, here's 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 the question. I believe in my core that the mortgage industry, you know, can put a massive dent in financial literacy in America. Like we can, you know, can we solve it? I don't know. But can we put a dent if the, if, if loan officers started partnering with realtors and started really educating high school and college students and getting out there and outreaching? Like I think, and by the way, I think we could do it. And we could also get loans. Like it would be like good Absolutely. for the community and it could be good for business. So I know you agree. So I'm not going to ask you, hey, do you agree? But, <laughs> but yes. what, are, what are your thoughts on that? And what's your cry to every loan officer, no matter what company they're with, to like be more than a loan officer? Like be, get out, I'd say a mortgage coach, be someone who really helps families um, achieve that dream. What's your cry on that? And then Kristen, I'll give it to you. Yeah. So move, movements um, mission statements. We exist to love and value people, right? And uh, people go, well, all right, what's that? What's that mean? And so it's a great question. I went to I went to uh, Catholic high school. It's the Math High School. It's little teeny all guys high school in in in, in D.C. And uh, as a freshman, I sat in there in the front row, and Father Ed got up on the board and wrote, "Love." And he took his pen out. He goes, "To love is to act in the long term best interest of another." Right. So, so he actually created love and made it a verb, right? He said to love is to act a lot of different ways you could define, it, but it, the way he defined the way we define it at movement is to act in the long-term best interest of another. And so when we say we exist to love and value people, we think about our teammates, our customers and the communities that we're a part of. And I think the question you asked Dave was like, man, how do we love and value our customers? How do we, how do we bring value to their life? What does that look like? And how should we do it? And I, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the, the home, as we all know, is the largest asset sitting on most people's personal balance sheet, coupled with the largest debt and one of the scariest and most pivotal commitments they can make in their life. And so I think it's, it's incumbent on every loan officer in America to bring value right, to their community um, and help them act in their long term best interest and in giving them expert knowledge on how to leverage that asset most efficiently to man, accomplish the goals they have in life, whether it's, you know, send their kid to college, um, you know, pay off credit card debts, take a great vacation. You know, there, there's so many hopes and dreams that we get to, to, to hear from our clients in that really intimate conversation. And uh, the, I think the worst thing we could do is just leave them with the transaction of giving them a $400,000 piece of debt with nothing else accompanying it. That's the lowest form of uh, relationship and value, right? We can bring them. You, you yeah. help so well, Dave, I think in Mortgage Coach, Think about that home as a, a massive opportunity to accomplish your hopes and dreams and goals in life and how you can leverage that asset to uh, to do exactly that. And that's what I think our loan officers need to be doing um, for, for first time home buyers and folks that have owned houses for years and maybe even have one passed down generationally. You know, that opportunity exists for everybody. Yeah. And just to give a little tactical coaching, you know, to anyone listening to this. The difference between a loan officer and someone that's really helping the family understand and make a decision is you know, going beyond, here's your rate, your payment, your cash to close, showing them options, and then showing them how that's going to look in five years and 10 years. And and so especially right now with all the folks that have homes, that they're at 2% and 3% and rates are at 7%. And even when they're at 6%, they're still going to be high. It's going to be more important that you vision cast, hey, what does this decision mean to you five years and 10 years from now? And for all the first time home buyers that, they are in a financial, you know, um, affordability challenge. It's important for you to vision cast what going from renting to owning looks like in five years and 10 years. So I just, my cry, cry to the industry, whether you're a movement loan officer, every, you know, what, no matter what channel of business you're in the mortgage, like yeah. we can change the industry, but we gotta, you know, we gotta do outreach in schools and we gotta deliver, you know, clarity beyond the transaction. So, Krista, what do you, what, where should we go next? Well, I want to continue on this thread and then we can move into other areas of the business. But I just, um, I know you guys have, I don't think you coined the phrase, but certainly when you type in impact lending, movement is at the very top. And I, I know that this is, you know, partly what you're describing here, but would love for you to kind of define that for us. Um, and then also, you know, I, 
I built, spent most of my career uh, building a company called Cultural Outreach, which I sold to Namba, but it was focused on reaching young and diverse markets. Um, and I, I think a lot of times the frustration I had was that people had already made a lot of mistakes by the time they were coming into buying their first home, or you were talking about some of the mindset challenges and all the things that are really ingrained in us. And through the work that you're doing on the impact side and on the nonprofit side, I would love for you to speak to how that is influencing things on the, on the business side. I mean, you, you have incredible stats on the number of families. I think I saw 66,000 families served. Um, and, but how does that translate to, if it does, to yeah. you know, improving business outcomes as well. Yeah. I love the question, Kirsten. And, and, and you know, this actually gets all the way back, Dave, to, to your earlier question of like when we started movement uh, and why and you know, what that looked like. So in 2008, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, you know, for those of you guys around the country, they call Charlotte around here the first city built on banking. Right. So we don't have a big river. We don't have a mountain chain. We don't have an ocean. We have uh, two giant banks. We had, you know, Wachovia and Bank of America, right, headquartered here. Now we have Truist and East Coast, Wells Fargo and B of A. And um, Charlotte didn't need another bank. Charlotte did not need another bank. I think our nation did not need another bank. Our nation certainly did not need another mortgage bank in 2007, 2008. Uh, and so what we said, Chris, at the time was, you know, if we're going to build something, let's build something unique and let's actually, let, let's build something that doesn't exist right now. And so we said we want to build a community that loved and valued people. And they, 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 man, if, if 07, 08 had been kind of marked by, by financial service companies kind of um, being known for what they had taken for communities, we wanted to think about, man, how can we how can we be known for what we give you know, to communities and, and really give to the marginalized in communities? Um, we know we're going to help folks with, with means by homes. We know we're going to do that. The question really, like, to be unique is, man, what can we do for those that can't even be customers right now? And how do we lift the entire community together? So that sounds kind of big and audacious. And I can tell you, it was like almost embarrassing to say when we had four employees. It's a lot more fun to talk about when we have 5,000 have done some things since then. But uh, but that was the vision. It's like, let's do something different. Let's just, the world just doesn't need one more originator. It doesn't need one more mortgage bank. It needs somebody that wants to bring unique value. And so really early on, we didn't have that phrase impact lending. I hadn't heard it at that time. I hadn't seen all these impact companies, but our heart and spirit was was that. It was, I, I kind of said I'd gone from football where, where it was about entertainment and I wanted to start making an impact, like a real meaningful impact in people's lives that, that, that changed it for the better. And so we we thought really early on, I said, you know, this is a business you can make great, a great living in. That's fantastic. And I said, you know, I'll make a great living, but I want to take the profit of the company and put it in a not-for-profit. And I, wouldn't it be neat? Like, wouldn't it be fun if we all worked for a company that took its profits and reinvested it back into the communities that we were all a part of? And, and, and this, it was it was really just a concept, Chris, to do something differently. You know, like, how can we do something differently and make a uh, dramatic impact? And so, for, yeah, for the last 15 years, um, we've been building movement as an impact lender. And that we, 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 we again, we saw some companies like Patagonia and others. Um, mm -hmm. that started to come out and define that, you know, they, they, they gave away all the equity to, um, you know, a foundation that invests in, in um, the, the world, you know, the world that, that, that a lot of their enthusiasts enjoy. And so really similarly, we want to say, hey, movement, and we're about investing, reinvesting back in the communities that we're all a part of. And we want to do that by investing in the part of our communities right now that are not being served, that aren't on a trajectory to enjoy home ownership, that, that aren't on a 98% of the kiddos in Charlotte, North Carolina, if you're born into poverty, you will die in poverty. 98%. Think about that. Wow. Yeah. The, okay. There's a 20 year life expectancy discrepancy, depending on what zip code you're born in. Wow. That's incredible. It's yeah. Incredible. I, so, yeah. And so that was our thing, Chris, as we sit there, and that's, this is basically true in every major metropolitan city in America. And here we are as mortgage originators, right? Where we think the key to unlocking so much opportunity for Americans, particularly those that are trapped in poverty by helping them realize the dream of home ownership. And so, um, yeah, early on we said, wouldn't it be fun if the profits of the, of the company that we generate from doing what we all do in the mortgage industry, we took those and started building schools to bring these concepts to kiddos who right now, 98% of whom are gonna die in poverty. They're never gonna break that cycle in their lifetime. You know, we build our prisons in North Carolina based on the third grade reading level of our little boys. And we, this has got to change, guys. Like, this has got to change. And so, you know, again, the world didn't need one more person just issuing mortgages, but I think it did need, and we do need, and we do need passionate originators around the U.S. that are thinking about how can I start to solve and fix and, and put a dent in some of these big persistent problems that exist in every major metropolitan city in America. And it takes a whole lot more than one company. And so, yeah, we were really honored to, like, jump into that impact company uh, 
space and particularly impact lending company and start to uh, become a part of that by taking our profits, reinvesting them back into the community in really meaningful ways. You know, we're, we're actually honoring our first billion dollar originator, Lindsay Goins. We're cutting a ribbon on our sixth school on Monday. And, uh, and Lindsay has a huge plaque, her name over a big door, because you know, every one of us, our biggest originators, all build into all these schools. And that's what originators all over you know, the nation are doing, and certainly with your organization as well. So that was our passion early on. That's that's kind of how we're living into it today. We've committed a billion dollars to build 100 schools for kids born to poverty. Um, the next eight years, we're, we're, we're three years in right now. So um, it's been really incredible. We're, we're, we're excited to kind of keep pressing forward with that work. That's incredible. And I'm sure you attract a lot of people that are, you know, mission driven and and certainly younger people are are more attracted to working for companies that are, you know, investing in their communities. And um, so I love to see that. And I hope others are inspired by that model. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really that, cool too. Realtors, realtors get super excited about it as well, right? And I mean, oh, we know yeah. like 70% of American consumers are saying, Hey, I want to work with a company that represents my values. And that's you know, folks love working with companies they have an affinity for. I mean, I, you know, I think about, you know, you look at Ben and Jerry's, you can look at Patagonia or Tom Shoes, so many of these organizations that um, have been doing that. I think there's a really neat space for companies to do that in the lending space and banking space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dave, do you want to take the next one? I do. I do. I, you know, I do hope people are really inspired in the mortgage industry to to be more than a loan officer, you know, whether that is donating money, uh, that is making sure every consumer you run a credit report gets more than just a prequal. They they get education on what the future of homeownership can mean for them and, and what it can mean for others. I mean, for all the families that have equity in America, they've never been in a better position to help their kids buy a duplex, buy a triplex, buy a, you know, while your kid's going to college, buy a house and rent out two of the bedrooms. And, and help them get started. There's never been more down payment assistance programs in America than we have today. And, and by the way, guys, there's never been a better, just plug for Trust Engine Mortgage Coach. There's never been a, it's never been easier for you as a mortgage professional to, to help families understand that. So I hope everyone will take that seriously. Kristen, I'm going to not completely pivot, but there's an important question that I think everybody would love to hear. Um, almost every executive I talk about, like, this is the year, like if you're in the mortgage business, this is where the year where you started January and you found out the data that 63% of homes in America that have mortgages start with two or 3%. And you're like, oh, that's going to be interesting. Um, but if, if forget about mortgage industry, if you're just a human being in America or in the world, um, this will go down as 2023 was the year where we found out what AI could do. And we, Ooh. and we found out, how quickly it was coming, you know, like, I remember the first time I played with chat GBT, I was like, what, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so what oh, impact do you think that's going to have on lending? What impact do you think that's going to have in our industry? I, I think, you know, it's everyone's kind of wondering and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah. No. So the first time I saw I was sitting in a hotel room with my 17 year old and uh, she was daddy. You, you, can, can, can I show you something? Like, yeah, maybe she's like, look at, look at this, my friend and her friends had all sent to her. And it was like this new thing of, you know, how are you going to write your papers and stuff? And so she's showing, and, and yeah, I had the same reaction. They went, Oh my gosh, where was this when I was in high school? No, I didn't say that, but I did. I did. Uh, I, I said that, bro. I, I did. I <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's so incredible. And I actually Montel that I was talking about, we, we were having fun the other day on social and he wrote a couple of social posts for black home ownership and he gave the prompts to chat GPT. And man, it was, it was as though his words were like coming out right onto the social post. And you go, gosh, when, when AI can like more artistically and, and compellingly like articulate what's in our heart, that's terrifying. <laughs> You like to think like the humanness of us, right? Like, like we can at least express our hearts and our emotion, our passion. You're like, AI just had more emotion than I do. That's 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 pretty scary. Um, or exciting, you know, or exciting. And so I'm I'm like for better or worse, I'm using one of those glass half full guys. Um, I kind of look at all this stuff and go, man, I, I think there's like massive opportunity for impact for those that 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 stay near to it and and see where it goes and where it evolves. And I think it's no different for AI. You know, I, I remember when I first got into this, they were telling me that, you know, any year now that underwriters were going to be a thing of the past, um, that we had this, you know, thing DU that was just a couple more clicks and buttons we were going to have figured out and you weren't going to need a human to underwrite alone anymore, you know? And um, I think a lot of us could imagine a place where really you actually don't. 
Um, and yet, you know, we're in line with our federal government and things move more slowly than, than technology is capable of. And so um, you have a chance to keep pace. And while technology has evolved the business a ton in the last 15 years, and I think that 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 change will compound surely over time. Those loan officers and those companies that stay close to this technology, you know, AI, um, OCR, just just all the things that, that, are, that are kind of coming out and how they're coming together are the ones that are going to take more market share with it. Um, and, and I think, you know, that that is that's been kind of a consistent trend. So I don't think this is something that's going to jump up. And in six months, um, folks aren't going to have jobs. Right. It absolutely is going to impact and shift our marketplace and those companies, and those LOs that are intentional. To, to you know stay on the forefront be aware of how to use it begin to leverage it in small ways maybe right now it's writing social media posts right maybe right now it's bringing that trusted content like you said Dave to to your community right through um really in, insightful um ideas on how to leverage a home for wealth building or what to do if you're at three percent you want to buy a new or a new home you know like this is these are problems chat GPT can solve for you if we leverage it you know the folks that are fearful of it that don't engage in it yeah you're going to be swallowed up by those that do and that like lean in and think through how to leverage this tool to help them aggregate more business one macro trend i think is um gonna play out with all of these things dave right is that that the winners that emerge from this are going to take more and more market share, right? There are going to be winners in this market. There are going to be a lot of folks sorted out and those that emerge, we're going to, and that's in true for individual loan officers and that's true for companies. And so I think, you know, technology is going to help folks do that. Those that lean into technology are going to win in big ways. And those that don't and stay kind of fearful from it or far from it um, are in many ways going to be left behind. No borrower left behind. We want no loan officer left behind by uh, staying away like from technology. That. I like that. I like that. So let me just ask a follow-up question to that and and share one one thought that goes through my mind. Now I'm a kid. I I am dyslexic, so spelling was never my thing. And when computers came out, you know, I was not a computer nerd. I took typing in high school, so I had some skills. But I I took I started using computers because of spell check. I'm like, oh, I could meet someone. I could write a letter. And it doesn't have spelling errors. And and I loved CRM because I'm ADD. And I'm like, oh, I can put in a reminder. And and so I look at I look at um AI as another thing that elevates everyone, you know, because yeah. I don't know where I read it, where I heard it, but that you know, IQ, the higher the IQ, there are exceptions. The the more opportunity, the happier, the more successful. And now I see like the collective IQ of every human being can be higher, can be closer to equal. And so I really believe that- I think are you the matrix right now? Is that where I'm- Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't in. know if I'm going so far as matrix, but I just believe <laughs> everyone that yeah, jumps in can just, it's an IQ booster. It's a, it's a capabilities booster. And I do think we're moving into an era, at least in mortgage, where there's gonna be the haves and the have nots and the haves. Everybody has technology. Not everybody uses technology. Everybody- has access to data. And so tell me if you agree with this. I think every loan officer needs to become a data-driven mortgage advisor. Like they, like that is the future of lending. You know, definitively. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm making a little bit light of, of some, some of this stuff, but I'll tell you, like when we started our company with, in 2008, you guys, yeah, it, it's hard to go back to this time, but like, imagine like Facebook had like, just started to launch. There was just this thing, right? People were just starting to talk about Facebook and how you do this. And so um, we couldn't compete with, with B of A and with Wachovia and some of these massive national lenders. But what we could do was go teach our realtors how to leverage this new little social media platform, Facebook, to drive business and referrals. And I used to joke that I thought the F on Facebook stood for free, you know, because you didn't have to pay for it. It was free marketing. It was the greatest thing ever. It was like the greatest database marketing tool that I'd ever seen or ever imagined. And now, you know, you talk to loan officers. And if you're not leveraging social media, I mean, you've just kind of, you've missed a lot of, um, of the wave of the market share, you know, right. And, and, and AI, I think is going to be going to be no different. You're just gonna have to stay attuned and, and close to how you leverage this tool to maximize market share. And, and there's going to be, listen, there's gonna be negative, uh, there's gonna be pros and cons to it as well. Right. I and mean, we can look at a lot of things about social media right now. Where we know statistically there are some negatives and some downsides to this tool. Also any powerful tool, you know, nuclear power has, you know, profound um, opportunity to uh, impact lives positively and also, you know, to 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 be destructive in some ways as well. So I think AI is is no different. You know, we're going to need to be thoughtful about how we approach it. But um, for, yeah, for those that, that harness it in the right way with right intention, it's going to be yeah, absolutely transformationally powerful, transformationally powerful. So I, I think it's exciting. But yeah, I think, again, it's going to take a lot of intentionality, right? How are we going to use this for uh, for good? Um, so I want to ask you a question, a little different direction again, but um 
the biggest problem facing our affordability challenges and the purchase market today is inventory. And, um, and I'm wondering if, you know, we're in a really, you know, low inventory time. Do you have any thoughts on solutions around that or, uh, regulate? uh yeah, allow, allow builders <laughs> to get permits. I mean, yeah, I mean, genuinely, I'm kind of, I'm kind of half joking. I, I got a great friend here, um, uh, with large private home builders in America. And, um, he actually wants to be an impact builder. You know, they, they donate a significant amount of their profits. He really wants to see a lot of these same issues, Kristen, that we're passionate about um, rectified. He actually went to his, um, his his local major city municipality and said, I, any plot of land that, 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 that uh, the city wants, I will build at cost, you know, at cost for any borrower. No profit margin whatsoever. We'll build at cost for first-time home buyers for our city. It was going to take them two and a half years to get the plots of land entitled and approved for him to build on. And there, there are, you know, um, there are just some fundamental things that we are going to have to work on as a nation to expedite good work, you know, good work in our country that needs to be done. And um, oftentimes that's like that's busting bureaucracy. That's one of the reasons we're passionate about building charter schools because it creates choice for kids. Like we think the kid should be the customer and the dollar should follow the kiddo. In similar ways, I mean, if we're going to create, um, you know, we can build houses for about 8000 bucks right now. We digitally concrete, do a digital concrete print of a house. We're, we're actually helping build them in the Dominican Republic and in Mexico and a couple other places where you can build it for about $8,000. Imagine if we could bring Americans a, an affordable, safe dwelling place for under 10,000 bucks. How would that, I mean, I, you know, you guys are in LA, like you get Skid Row out there, there, there there's, there's these mass pockets of homelessness and poverty. If we could provide permanent, safe housing now it's not going to have every OSHA regulation. It's not going to have you know every um, uh, HUD regulation, and 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 that and that and that's a trade-off, right? That we'd have to make. But we have the capability and the technology to solve a lot of these problems and create affordable dwelling places for folks. Um, but but regulation really makes it difficult to execute on any of this. And so I, I do think you know we need to look our politicians in the eye and ourselves in the eye, and you know we're going to be part of this solution too, right? To actually proffer solutions, not just kind of like pick it and yell on one side of a political hour or another, but actually come to our politicians with solutions as the industry experts of here is a solution that you guys could implement to lift this community. And that's what we've, again, that's that's the approach that we're trying to take. And, and, the, and the, the thing I'd give to folks as an encouragement is, man, uh, uh, you know, just like folks like to demonize bankers, folks like to demonize politicians. Are there bankers that are jerks? Of course. Are there politicians that are jerks? Of course. But they're an overwhelming number of, of, of just good citizens and Americans that all want to see their communities thrive. We've come to them with some really pragmatic bipartisan solutions. And you know what? People get really excited about those. A lot of folks are looking for solutions. And so, I mean, I challenge our, our industry, you know, peers and, and professionals that are in this to be bringing solutions, man, to your politicians, to some of these really meaningful issues that you see. And, and, and I think you'd be surprised by the receptivity. It just takes some time to get some of these laws passed. Yeah. And it differs so much by community too. And so knowing what the, you know, what those challenges are and getting to know the local bureaucracy, as you said, I think can make a really big difference, especially when it comes to like zoning laws and things like that, that could, small changes could make a really big difference in that area. So and I you're right. That. I mean, and it's not, it's not one issue, right? It's like I mean, every San Francisco has really different issues than South Alabama. Like they both have a, a housing issue. They both have affordable housing issues. But the way you need to approach those and, and the problems to solve are very different. But I, I think it takes us as the as the industry pros to get involved in the lead and not okay. just kind of behind from the sidelines, but to actually jump in, get involved. And, um, you know, it's kind of, I think it's a lot of civic duty in a lot of way for us to, to get involved in our local communities. Yeah, totally. Yeah, no, I push everyone, you know, going hyper local, hyper personal is a great business strategy going forward for all local referral based mortgage professionals. And, and and going beyond the transaction is the future, you know, of lending, because uh, AI and automation and all the different business models are going to continue to make a transaction more automated. Um, but if you're local, you're referral based, and you are really helping bring local news, and then you're personalizing. You're helping consumers say, "Hey, this is what's happening on a national level. This is what's happening on a local micro level, and this is how it impacts me personally." Guys, and then if we take that to schools and we partner with realtors and financial planners, like guys, we, you know, I call it the captain of the wealth team. We as an industry can really put a dent in some of the biggest problems in America today. So I do want to close out because I know we're running out of time here, but, you know, 
Chris and I are doing this interview as part of our halftime report. So we're going to pull, pull quotes from this. We're a little past halftime. So, uh, you know, we're getting into the third quarter. Well, we're way into the third quarter. Um, but but we want to give a report. And one of the things I'm kind of asking everybody is, you know, I want you to speak directly to loan officers that are in the trenches. And let's just talk about like, hey, they got to they got to have better sales skills. So they have less price exceptions and they're delivering more value. They got to be calling realtors and prospecting. But if if you had just a quick, you know, couple minute, uh, you know, Casey Crawford advice to any loan officer, listen to this. What are the two? What are the two actions they need to be doing so they survive this market and they're ready to thrive as we turn? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to circle all the all the way back, Dave. And the first thing is, man, anyone that's listening to this is still in the business. Uh, man, big virtual fist bump, hug, chest bump, whatever you want to do. You, congratulations, man. You're, you're winning. You're winning. By being in this business right now, you're winning. Doesn't feel like it. It feels harder than it should, but you're winning. And by listening to this podcast, you're winning. I, I really believe that. You're taking the time to equip yourself to be a pro, to get encouragement, to equip yourself, to go out there and bring value to your community. And I can tell you, you've already separated yourself right from the bottom 50%. Bottom 50% are already out of this thing. Like, that's cool. That's usually where I stayed academically for a long part of my career. Like, they're already gone. They're gone. You're already, you're winning and you're doing better than you think you are. You, you, you really are. You are doing better than you think you are and that you feel. And, and I know it's tough right now. It's, I can tell you, it's tough for me. It's tough for every CEO. It's tough for everyone that's in this industry is dealing with the adversity of kind of running uphill. And the longer you're in it, the, every day that you wake up, Stay committed to this, stay committed to equipping yourself to be a more informed professional, to bring more value to your community, your realtors, your gaining ground and picking up market share. And, and the, you know, that's kind of the second thing. I think, you know, in times of adversity, thinking um, it gets so easy to have a scarcity mindset of, 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 oh, man, I hope that realtor has a deal for me. Oh, man, I hope this borrower goes with me. I hope uh, you know, I can get a loan from them. Oh, man, Dave Savage, I, he, he must know a lot of people. I want to feel he'll give me a referral. You know, you know a loan officer needs a company to work for. And we think a lot about what we can get from folks in times of scarcity, right? Because we feel like we're, we're at a deficit, you know, it's hard. We need something. I need more loans, I need more loan officers, I need more margin, I need more something. So we think a lot about what we can get from people to meet our needs. And I'd encourage you just as you wake up in the morning and start interacting with folks, think about what you can do for them. Think about what kind of value you can bring to them, what you can do to break their life a little better you know, equip them to have more success in their home, equip that realtor. What can you do for that realtor to help them grow their business, grow their market share? And I um, mean, that combination of, of, of being encouraged that you're still in it, knowing that you're taking ground and then daily thinking about how you can equip yourself so that you can pour yourself back out into the lives of your teammates, your partners, the uh, realtors that you're working with. Um, it's a way to stay encouraged. And, and I can tell you, people can sense it. They, 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 really, they really can sense it when you're interacting with them. If you want something from them or you want something for them, I mean, you come to that meeting wanting so much for them, wanting to see their business thrive, wanting to help them um, set themselves up with the professionals, man, they can see it. And I think they'll, they'll be gravitated towards working with someone like you. So cut yourself some slack. It's tough. It's tough for everybody out there. <laughs> be encouraged. You know, as long as you woke up at breath in your lungs this morning, you are still in the game. You're in the fight and you are taking ground on your competitors. There will be a lot better day. There will be better times to come. We'll celebrate them on the other side. And in the process, man, have some joy in the journey by thinking about what you can do for those around you, not what you can get from those around you. That that was awesome. I, I made me think as you were closing out there that that video by Jocko, good. You know, yeah, having they, some problems, good. If they, you're in, and then if you're still in the fight, you're still in the hunt, you're you're still in the game. So stay in there. So. I'm going to give you closing thought in a minute, Casey. But Kristen, as we wrap this up, any anything you want to say to the audience to help them take action on anything they've heard here today? Well, personally, I am so inspired by this conversation. So Casey, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Um, I do think, uh, of course, we have First Home IQ nonprofit that uh, we've launched, and that is a way that people can connect with their local communities and um, give back in some some way related to the business. So we'd love to um, have people go to firsthomeiq.com and check out how to be involved there if you're interested in that mission. So. Well, love I am that. personally interested in that mission, Chris, and I love it. it. It was great to connect with you and hear a little bit more about that. Moving Foundation is going to make a ten thousand dollars gift to First on my queue um, for you. What? Like, that is, what? Yeah, I, 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 we need more. <laughs> wow. of that. I think we need to, we need to encourage and support each other in these kind of things. I love that you're doing it. You know, we are all about being an impact lender. We love others seeing 
Um, think about purpose bigger than themselves, you know, in this. And I think, listen, our nation needs that right now. You know, our nation needs that right now. We, we've got to think about places we can come together and lift communities together and stop thinking about ways we're going to tear each other apart. So thank you for leading from the front in that regard. It's an honor to come behind you and support you. And Dave, thank you, man. Truly, truly thank you, buddy. I mean, I, 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 I you know, I kind of laugh when I said it, but, but genuinely, you know, your work, to equip and inspire this industry is what got me into it. I, I was really sitting as a 29 year old um, father of one at the time, got two now, you know, young dad, not knowing what it was I was going to do with my life after football. And um, the interview that you had with Bill Dallas and your agreement with him, uh, good or not, I'm, I cussed you a couple of those days after, after making that decision, but it gave me the courage, the confidence to get into this space. And to really believe in it. And man, the, the blessing that, that that's been in my life for the last 15 years has been really, really profound, man. It takes guys like you going first and, uh, and continuing, man, just faithfully sharing that those messages of hope and inspiration and promoting this industry. And, uh, you know, I think there, there are there are there's fruit coming out from seeds that you sown that you might never see or know about, man. But just be encouraged that that, that is happening well beyond, I'm sure, your uh, radar of 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 communication, man. I'm, I'm one of those. I'm one of those, man. So thank you for so well, faithful leading for 15 years. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I'm going to close out with guys. And I've been talking a lot about this from stage that my entire career in mortgage rates have gone down and they went down to the bottom and, and my entire career in mortgage speed to lead was always like, that was the key. Like first one there wins. And my message, and I trade on this all the time, it's no longer enough to speed to lead. We are in an era going forward in mortgage where it's about speed to need. There's a lot of needs out there. You gotta, so we've gotta predict, get to the consumer before they have a need. Uh, I, I came, that kept echoing my head because I was thinking about, Kristen, what you're doing, speed to need. There's a lot of financial Ill illiteracy in high schools and colleges. Um, heck, baby boomers, most customers don't, have that financial literacy, speed to need. Uh, whatever your local community is, find out where you can help as a mortgage professional. Hopefully you're inspired by Casey and Movements Impact Lending. And let's let's just get out there as an industry, speed to need is the key to not only financial success, but to make impact as an industry. So uh, Casey, you're the man, brother. Appreciate sure. that. Yeah, yeah. That was a great interview. Take care if you guys are watching this whatever channel you're watching this on, if it's our uh, Trust Engine YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe. That is our executive um, innovation channel. And if you're watching this on the Mortgage Coach YouTube channel, subscribe, best practices for loan officers. Take care, everybody.